Welcome to Stories of Freedom, a podcast about discovering and embracing who you are in Christ. On each episode, you'll hear from people who have overcome obstacles, gained freedom, and found abundant life. Then we'll look back at each interview through a biblical lens and figure out what could apply to your life and your story, because knowing your identity changes everything. Thanks for joining us. We're excited to share these stories and biblical principles. Every believer needs to know who they are in Christ, how to fight the battle for the mind, and how to walk by faith in repentance. Stories of Freedom is a production of Freedom in Christ Ministries. I'm Dan Stute, President of Freedom in Christ USA. And I'm Abby Batson, your co-host. Today we're going to hear from Steve Goss. Steve is the President of Freedom in Christ International and oversees the work of Freedom in Christ around the world. He also wrote one of our core discipleship resources called the Freedom in Christ Course. But before all of this, Steve was a successful businessman who served in his local church. Then one day, his pastor asked him to disciple a couple who were struggling, but Steve struggled to help them make any real progress. I remember one of them saying, oh yeah, but I really don't think God loves me. And I was like, we did that last week. (laughs) And they were really, really trying to get hold of truth, but they just couldn't hold on to it. Now, I've since realized that I'm exactly like that. It's just not so obvious in my case because I haven't had the horrendous experiences they've had. Um, But I've realized that I am just the same. Shortly after that, Steve picked up a copy of the book, The Bondage Breaker, and with the help of his pastor, took the couple through the prayer and repentance process at the back of the book called The Steps to Freedom in Christ. The couple was dramatically changed, and Steve began teaching the material to others in the church, too. This was the beginning of a new calling for Steve and eventually a new chapter for Freedom in Christ. So without further ado, here's our interview with Steve Goss. Well, Steve, it is great to see you and good morning from us and good afternoon to you over there in England. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Dan. Hi, Abby. Well, Steve, we'd love to uh, share stories of freedom, how God has worked in people's lives and then through them to help others um, experience the freedom that Christ has purchased. And so we look forward to having you share some of your journey uh, with us and our listeners uh, today. And so will you tell us just a little bit about what was childhood like for you growing up there in central England? Oh, I think um, I'd say I had a pretty normal childhood, if there is any such thing. Good parents, nice home. Um, I I was discussing this with my parents the other day. My mum has just turned 90. And uh, I was, we were talking about whether or not they took me to church as a child. I'm adamant that they didn't, um, but they begged to differ. Um, They said, at least I think for the first few years of my life, I think they did attend a church. But to all intents and purposes, as I was growing up, that wasn't that wasn't part of my experience. So um, they'd they'd stopped going um, pretty early on, I think, in my childhood. But they were great parents. It was a good childhood. Um, Still are great parents. I still have them both. Wonderful. So how did you come to know Christ then? If you weren't in church, uh, how did God reach out to you and draw you to himself? When I was 12, I moved up to um, what you would call a high school. And there's a great teacher in the school who was an out-and-out Christian. And I think he was he underwent quite a lot of mockery for his stance, but he was um, he was really sold out for God, and he did all sorts of things essentially to try and get the gospel across. And uh, I went along to watch um, the Cross and the Switchblade movie uh, that he was running, um, and I picked up a John's Gospel um, after that um, and read it and. Um, prayed the prayer at the end, essentially, that was written in the book. Um, And I knew immediately that something had changed. I did feel quite different. I couldn't have told you exactly how, but I knew that I knew something was very different the minute I'd I'd prayed that prayer. 
Um, so we're just going to move on a little bit, fast forward a few years in your life. Um, so you, that was at age 13 and you continue following God. But as you get older, you know, you're doing the Christian things. You're having a daily quiet time with God. You even start serving on leadership team at your church. But will you tell us at that time in your life, how would you describe your relationship with God or what was your view of God? Yeah. So at that time in my life, um, I was really quite excited by my job more than anything else. So I'd um, I'd been to university and I'd got a job um, in marketing. I was working for IBM, so um, you know, large computer company. It was all very kind of fast moving, and um, I found it very impressive. And I just got kind of caught up in that. Um, and so that's kind of what occupied my thoughts. Most of the time, I'd be thinking about the next project or what I had to do on Monday or whatever. So my relationship with God just became quite a lot less exciting somehow. It's, it's like it was just squeezed out a little. Um, I had got married to Zoe, um, and that was fun. Um, and we were attending this little Baptist church in the place where we'd settled, which was away from our home area. We were trying to make friends. Or whatever, um, and so we, you know, if we'd been in that, well, I'm sure that the pastor of that church thought, you know, we were we were good Christians, as it were. We were doing okay, you know, we were helping with stuff and um, joining in. But as I look back, I know that my relationship with God had become quite distant. So you you asked Abby about, you know, what was my kind of view of God at that time? Um, I think, to be honest even though I didn't really have any Christian upbringing, um, I'd already um, kind of absorbed a kind of legalistic view of God, Um, seeing him as a a guy who was really very interested in whether or not I was putting a foot wrong. Um, And so less, I mean, I knew he loved me, that was his job, Um, but less a kind of really knowing that love and more of um, a sense of, you know, am I am I living up to his expectations and kind of knowing I wasn't, um, and so always a sense of falling short of of the, the kind of standards that I felt God kind of had for me, um, and so I guess always feeling somewhat guilty, um, and of course when you feel guilty, you don't really want to go into the presence of the one that makes you feel guilty. So I I did still have a quiet time most days because I think that was my legalistic duty. <laughs> but but the, my quiet times were very quiet, if you know what I mean. Um, and, and so I think it, it did become a kind of going through the motions um, rather than the, the excitement I had known. I mean, I should say, going back to my school days, um, I was one of the first to become a Christian, but very soon after, like a revival broke out in my school. And in in my class, um, well, two or three years into school, 30 out of 32 of us were Christians and going on with God. And it was quite phenomenal looking back and really exciting. Um, and so all of that had kind of gone. And I just thought, well, I kind of grown up now and, you know, that's we're now into just kind of normal life and and so I'm focusing on my career and had a mortgage you know bought a house and so so the god stuff kind of just got squeezed so you mentioned Steve that legalistic um, perception of God and how you kind of fell into that cycle of oh I need to do these things to be accepted and uh, approved of by God um, just so that he'll be happy with me and I think a lot of people can resonate with that I definitely can um So I want to touch on one more thing. Uh, You also developed during this time kind of a cycle of sin, confess, sin, confess, which I think a lot of us too can resonate with, where we do something we know is wrong, we confess, we try to do better, and then we slip up and do it again, and it just kind of keeps going. Um, But you had, there was this time, there was a preacher at your church who came and spoke, and he offered a way out of this cycle, and it had a huge impact on your life. So what did the preacher say and how did that make a difference in your life? Yeah, so I was um I got stuck in watching the wrong kind of stuff on TV late at night. So nowadays it would be you know the internet 
um, but we didn't have such a thing at that time. So it was just watching the wrong kind of stuff on TV and, um, and feeling very guilty, you know, when I did that and saying, sorry, God, knowing I was kind of forgiven, um, well, knowing I was forgiven, but all the same, uh, still feeling very guilty. And so again, that was part of the whole relationship with God just ending up um, a lot less sparky, let's say, than it was. And so, yeah, so I was sitting in church one day, and uh, it was the day of the year when all the Baptist pastors swapped their pulpits. And so it made a nice change. So we got a guy called Frank in our church. I didn't know, but he was a pastor at another local Baptist church. And he was uh, talking, um, giving his sermon. And I suddenly, I, th I think I'm pretty sure I must have dozed off, but I suddenly became aware that he was speaking about this uh, this sin confess cycle, as you as you called it, Abby, where um, he was he was speaking from Romans six and seven, I think, a little bit of seven, and he was describing to a T getting caught in a sin and just not being able to give it up. And so at that point, I sort of perked up. I thought, oh, um, and then he said, and do you want to know how to get out of that? And I tried not to look too eager in case a bunch of people laid hands on me or something. But I really did want to know how to get out of it. And so um, I kind of was waiting for Frank's uh, answer, the key to all this. And he said, it's really simple. Stop. And I remember thinking, yeah, thanks, Frank. Actually, funnily enough, that was the first thing I thought of. And uh, it didn't work. <laughs> you know, I've tried stopping. Uh, in fact, every time as you know, I tried stopping, but I, I didn't. I couldn't. And so I, I was thinking, right, yeah, great. But he went on to show that God says in His Word um, that the power of sin is broken in the life of a Christian. And I took from that that yes, God's God's Word does say that. So even if it doesn't feel true to me. Um, I do believe that this is the word of God and therefore it is true. And I kind of have to, um, I have to make that connection with the truth. And I remember um, I went home from church that day uh, feeling kind of strange. And um, instead of you know, settling down to read the newspaper, which might have been the usual thing I would have done after church on a Sunday uh, or cooking a chicken or whatever, I went upstairs and I knelt down to pray. I don't, that was not my normal practice at all. And I opened the Bible at Romans 6 and I read it. And I, I just said something like, you know, God, um, it does say that here. It does say very clearly that the power of sin is broken in my life if I know you. And it doesn't feel true. And it doesn't seem true in my experience, but you've said it, so I, I choose to believe it. And um, that was that. I almost didn't think any more about it. But to my surprise, and I assure you this really was to my surprise, I walked away from that issue there and then um, and have never returned to it. Um, it doesn't always work like that, by the way, I now know. But that was my experience at that time. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned, yeah, for you, you prayed this prayer um, and it really did help and you were able to walk away from from that issue. For others, that might not be the case. So what is that step-by-step -step thought pattern um, that helps us to stop sinful behavior or patterns? Yeah, so um, I think there's something from that experience that we can take more generally. And, you know, I have to say, I found myself caught in other issues since then. And, you know, for example, one of my vulnerabilities is just eating too much. <laughs> so, um, and, and that one didn't work like, yeah, just stop. Um, I've had to go through more of a process, but, but it is the key thing I think for me in those kind of things has been identifying where my thinking is faulty or where, um, where you might say you're believing a lie. Um, and so I guess with that first experience of it, I was believing the lie that I couldn't stop, that I couldn't walk away from it, that the power of sin wasn't broken in my life. And, it's, and that was broken so dramatically that day that it kind of stuck. But with most other things, I've really had to work at working out what the lie is and then replacing that lie with the truth in God's word. 
Um, so I developed a procedure, if you like, that we now call stronghold busting um, and is incorporated into Freedom in Christ's teaching. Uh, but the very first one of those that um, I did was for my comfort eating. And I essentially, I looked at lots of verses in the Bible to do with eating, and I tried to work out what lie I was believing. And in the end, I worked out that the lie I was believing was that eating would bring me lasting comfort. And it was clear from God's word that actually that isn't the case. Eating doesn't bring lasting comfort. It might bring me some temporary relief, but then it becomes this habit and um, you know, overeating constantly uh, does you a lot of damage. Um, and so um, the first thing was to get hold of what the lie is. Um, the next thing was to be really clear on what the truth is. And that's where all these verses came um, that I'd found about you know, the truth about eating and gluttony and food. And then I found that um, I needed to work with that for quite a long period. Um, and I've, I've since heard that um, psychologists say it takes about six weeks to form a habit or to break a habit. And in effect, once you believe something like this and you're into that kind of repetitive action, it's, it's basically a habit. Um, and so um, I, would, I would make uh, a prayer, well, really a declaration. You know, I renounce the lie that eating brings me lasting comfort. You know, I announce the truth that, and I'd list off all these verses I'd found, um, and do that for um, you know, a six week or a 40 day period. Um, and there comes a moment when um, suddenly you know that you have renewed your mind in biblical language, when suddenly you do believe what the Bible says rather than the lie that you used to believe. And of course, that feeds through into your actions. You know, Steve, I was just having the conversation about developing stronghold busters with my Bible study life group last week or two weeks ago now. And uh, one of the questions that people often ask is, how do I identify the lie, that faulty thinking, that which uh, doesn't line up with the truth of God's word? What are some things that you personally or in the lives of others have seen helps people identify the lie? Hmm. Uh, that's a really good question, Dan, because it's the key issue. And it's not easy to identify the lie because it really feels true to you and you've lived with it for so long, you're convinced it is true. And when you go through this 40-day process for 37 of those days, it still feels very true and it feels like it's a waste of time. And so, um, so sometimes God hits you between the eyes with the truth, like he did with me when I was sitting in that church and a preacher helped me get hold of that. Um, more usually you do have to work at it and, it and it is a case of finding those verses. But I think um, a good Christian friend um, who you give permission to speak into your life would be a really good way of um, at least having a sounding board. Um, and, and very often people that know us well can see the issues in our lives much more clearly than we can see them. And so just being vulnerable enough to give someone else some permission to say, well, what about this? Or are you believing that? Um, I think could be a very good way of identifying something. But it is critical that you do you do um, identify that lie. And, and it's one reason uh, why we don't publish a whole lot of ready-made stronghold busters for people. So um, a couple of years ago, there was a lady who came to me and she said, I've been trying the stronghold busting for comfort eating, which is the same thing you did, Steve. And um, I've been through it time after time after time for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, and it's not made any difference at all. And I said, okay. Um, I said, so what lie were you actually trying to bust? And she said, well, I, I was using the one that's printed in the book. And so that's the one that I developed um, originally although I've made it a bit more poetic since then before we pu publish it. Um, 
And um, I said, oh, okay. So, um, you know, like me, you were believing the lie that overeating will bring you lasting comfort. She said, no, I've never really believed that. And I was saying, okay, so you spent all this time busting a lie that you don't believe. <laughs> and I think she just thought, oh, here's, you know, I, I know I've got an issue with comfort eating. Um, here's something that you know, Steve said worked for him. I'll just do this. But she hadn't done the thinking behind it. Because obviously for her, the reason she was overeating was a different reason to, to mine. And she needed to identify her own issue and then find some verses from God's word that were applicable to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so key, right? Because the scripture says that Satan is a deceiver. And uh, when we're deceived, we believe a lie. I think it's true, but uh, it, those lies are customized uh, according to how we've been brought up, the experiences we've had, any trauma that we've experienced. And so people really need to spend that time themselves discerning uh, what is the lie that they personally believe. And that takes some work, like you mentioned. It really does take some time and effort. It does. And the people that put in the time and effort um, – uh, the people who really get this concept and go for it, you know, you could do six or seven stronghold busters in a year. You could bust six or seven key lies that you've been believing. And the ones that do that, and I have to say they're quite few and far between, but the ones that do that, you see them take off in their Christian maturity. Um, and sometimes they're, they are people who have been among the most badly damaged and have had the worst experiences. And they really get hold of this concept. And it's so liberating for them when they realize that they can, they don't have to sit there as a victim, but they can deal with this stuff and they can change their thinking and they can move on from those things that have held them back for so long. Mm -hmm. Thanks for letting us go down that path, Steve. I think that was good and will uh, we'll help people uh, listening. But let's go back to your story. So here you are, you're, you're growing, you're learning some things, you're, you're overcoming this habit and pattern, serving in your church, but there's still things and people that you didn't know how to help. As a leader in your church, there was in particular one couple that you secretly kind of hoped wouldn't talk to you after church because you didn't know how to help them. It was around that time that you came across Neil's book, The Bondage Breaker. Tell us about that couple and how all this worked together to form your pathway uh, in that time. Yeah, so this was a couple in their 40s. Um, I was in my 30s at that time, I think. And um, they were in our church and uh, they felt on the edge of church. In their own words, they really wanted to be like everyone else but didn't seem able to. Um, they just had a lot of obvious problems. Um, and um, you know, when I got to know them, I realized why when I heard some of their stories, some of the stuff that had happened to them in the past. But I really did try to avoid them after church on a Sunday um, because, you know, they would come and over a cup of coffee, they would uh, essentially uh, share uh, the issues they were facing and then kind of look at me as if like, yeah, what shall I do? And I, I thought, I have not got a clue how I can help you. I know Jesus is the answer, but I have no idea how in your case. I just don't, I haven't the first idea what I would do with you uh, or how to help you. And then um, my pastor asked me uh, if I would disciple this couple because they'd asked to become members of our church. And he wasn't even sure whether, uh, whether they were Christians. And so he asked me if I would disciple them. And so I went through this experience of looking for a really straightforward discipleship course. And I found one. It was just like half a sheet of paper per week, essentially, um, that you went through. And it was a little topic. There was a couple of verses. There was a couple of questions. So it was a very straightforward discipleship course. And it enabled me once a week to spend an evening with them and get to know them and find out actually what lovely people they were and hear a little about the horrendous experiences they'd had. But the experience of discipling them was not at all straightforward. And in fact, I really found it frustrating. So I remember one week we we talked about the love of God. And, you know, there were some verses, God is love and, you know, God so loved the world and so on and so forth. 
And we'd talk about it. And by the end of the evening, I remember one of them saying, so God just loves me, just loves me, and that's it. And I said, yes, that's it. God loves you. And so we'd have a, have a cup of coffee, uh, um, and that was that. And then um, the next week or um, two weeks later or whatever, we would be doing some other topic. And I remember, I remember one of them saying, oh, yeah, but I really don't think God loves me. And I was like, we did that last week. <laughs> and th there was this all the time. They were really, really trying to get hold of truth, but they just couldn't hold on to it. Now, I've since realized that I'm exactly like that. It's just not so obvious in my case because I hadn't had the horrendous experiences they've had. Um, but I've realized that I am just the same. Um, but just telling them the truth even really simply and doing it three times or even with a great PowerPoint presentation, just telling people the truth doesn't do it. And in our Western world, we tend to think that that's what learning is about. It's intellectual. But it became obvious to me at that point that there was much more to it than that. Um, anyway, as you say, Dan, I was, um, I was out with the family one afternoon and I went into a Christian bookshop. And I suddenly had this feeling that I should buy this book, <laughs> which I'd never heard of, um, The Bondage Breaker by Dr. Neil T. Anderson. At that time, I was commuting up to London on the train every morning and uh, coming back in the evening. And I read this book on the train. I kind of hid it behind the newspaper. I thought it sounded like a mm. weird title, The Bondage Breaker. <laughs> um, but I loved the book. It, it didn't in itself tell me anything new, but I, the way I describe it is it joined the dots between a lot of different things. And it helped me understand that we live in a spiritual world and that there are other reasons why people can't get hold of truth other than an intellectual issue, um, that there can be spiritual reasons. And at the back of the book was this process called The Seven Steps to Freedom in Christ. I have to say, honestly, it, the whole kind of formulaic approach of it, it checked the box, it grated on me. It's not kind of the way I'm wired. Um, however, I was desperate. <laughs> and so I remember showing it to my pastor and saying, look, I'm really struggling with this couple. And there's this thing here that says it helps people resolve personal and spiritual conflicts. I really don't know what those are, but I know that these guys have got lots of them. And um, my pastor um, disappeared, went into his study, and he came back with a copy of The Bondage Breaker. Um, I don't think he'd read it, but he had it. And uh, he then came with me to this couple the following week. I was so pleased he did um, because he had a bit of training and stuff like that and I felt kind of out of my depth. I now know actually that I had no reason to feel out of my depth at all. It's all very straightforward, but that's how I felt at the time. And so we took this couple through the steps to freedom in Christ, or rather we selected a few bits and <laughs> the steps to freedom in Christ to take them through because we didn't know how to do it. You're supposed to start at the beginning and go through to the end. Um, but we just said, oh, some of these things in your childhood, tell us about those. Oh, right, let's find something. Okay, why don't you pray this prayer? Um, and they would pray a prayer. And so we did it in about half an hour. Normally it will take three or four hours. And um, anyway, what was really interesting was the results of that, which were absolutely dramatic. The lady, Linda, very shortly after that, she actually, um, she was diagnosed with a really nasty cancer that killed her within six weeks. Um, but it, I don't know, I don't understand why God allows this or does this. Um, but what that did allow us to see was just how clearly she was different following this experience. Um, I remember going to visit her in the hospice and she, she said, I want to be baptized. And, and this is a lady who was so shy. Uh, we didn't know that she knew God. Um, and, uh, and we baptized her there and then with a little jug of water in the hospice. Uh, but she, she went to be with Jesus with a, with a big smile on her face, honestly. Um, she was so, so different. Um, and it just brought it home to us. But I was really concerned about her husband, Peter, um, he had a history of nervous breakdowns. 
he didn't we discovered he didn't even know what bank they used he knew nothing about how they ran their lives she did all that and i remember thinking i just signed up to take these people through a short discipleship course and now i've got this guy <laughs> dependent on me but actually he survived it and more than survived it he didn't have another nervous breakdown he did well um and it was they were so changed despite the awful tragedy that happened to them. They were so changed that that my pastor and I started looking further into Dr. Neil and what other material he'd written. And we found that there was um, there was a course based on his uh, two key books. And we ordered it in from the States and we started teaching it in our church. And what we found was, because we ran it on a Sunday evening, uh, was the so-called, you know, it, we went to the other end of the spectrum. It was the good Christians, the keen Christians who would turn up for that. And they started getting um, great testimonies of how God changed their lives as they engaged with these principles and this material. And people, we then found people approaching us saying, you know, can you run this course again? I've my friend's life has been so dramatically transformed. And before we knew it, we had twice as many people come into this course we were running than we had people in our church. Uh, and it was just, uh, it was a little phenomenon. It was going from strength to strength. Wow. Steve, thank you for, for sharing all of that, um, especially going in depth about the story with that couple. I think it's one of the things that really stood out was how you said that they were trying to get hold of the truth. They wanted to believe the truth, but they were just having a hard time, that there were other things going on more than just the intellectual, okay, this is the truth and you should believe it, um, and how the steps and some of these biblical principles in the Freedom in Christ material uh, were so helpful. And so you mentioned you ran the courses at your church and you started having huge turnout and having other people coming to take the course. And so unexpectedly, Neil Anderson himself actually came to speak in the UK and you're able to meet him face to face. So will you tell us a little bit about that story? And from that time on, your life trajectory changed. So yeah, tell us about that. Yeah. So at about the time that we were running these courses and getting these results, and we were a little bit in touch with the uh, US Office of Freedom in Christ Ministries that was uh, based in uh, California at that time, I got a bizarre feeling that God might want us to open an office for Freedom in Christ in the UK. Um, and it was just a bizarre feeling. And anyway, um, Eventually, I, I thought I'd test that out, and I dropped an email in to the U.S. office and said, you know, A, do you have an office in the U.K.? And B, uh, if you don't, I wonder whether God might be calling us to um, start one. And um, we were referred to uh, an office in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, which I think was, there were just a few international offices at that time, and that was the only one in Europe. But of course, it's much easier for us to relate uh, to uh, to the US office, as at least we, we share a, a common language, or nearly, um, rather than the Swiss office, which was German speaking. Um, so that didn't help uh, being referred to them. And, and so I've debated this with Neil Anderson since, um, but the impression I had was that Freedom in Christ at that time had decided not to open any more overseas offices. Neil tells me he really doesn't remember any such decision. Uh, but anyway, that was the impression that I somehow got. And uh, and we were we were told that if, if we wanted to test it out, we should invite Dr. Neil over to the UK to run a conference. And um, we said, okay, well, what's involved in that? And uh, he was going to come with a team of people and we would uh, you know, have to have a venue. Our church was nowhere near big enough. We'd have to pay quite a lot of money in terms of accommodation. Um, and it said we'd give an honorarium. I didn't know what one of those was. I had to look it up. It's money anyway. Um, and so we looked at it and it was essentially going to be half the annual budget of our church to do that. And, and we thought, we've probably got this wrong. So we just left that uh, on the shelf and carried on with our little local phenomenon. Well, a matter of um, weeks later, the lovely lady who we were dealing with in the US office emailed to say, as you said, Abby, that Neil was coming to the UK. 
And it was the f- he'd been once before briefly to a, a conference for a, a, a kind of new church stream, but he hadn't been for seven years. Um, and we went back and said, well, where is he coming? And he was coming to Glasgow in Scotland and to Reading in England, uh, which is interesting because Reading in England was uh, where we live. And before I knew it, I had a, a call from our local large conference running church. And they said, uh, we invited this guy, Neil Anderson, to run our annual Bible teaching conference uh, because our bookstore manager's life was totally changed when he read one of Neil's books. We'd never seen such a change in anybody. And so we invited him. We never thought he'd come, but we've now heard that he's coming and we realize that we don't know anything about him, but we gather that you do. Is there any possibility that you might help us run this conference? So it's like, yeah, we can do that. Um, and we got to meet Neil Anderson face to face. God brought him to us. And I was able to explain to Neil that um, we felt God might be saying that we would want to, that he wanted us to open an office. And bizarrely, in my opinion, the first thing Neil said was, well, you'd have to be able to sell our resources by mail order. And at that time, I'd started my own business, which happened to be a mail order business. I had a warehouse full of people who did nothing but you know, open envelopes and send things out by mail. Um, and so it was just like God so clearly orchestrated that. And so um, Freedom in Christ checked us out. They sent someone else over just to check that we were okay. Um, they decided we were, and we opened uh, Freedom in Christ in the UK. And I just tacked it on to my office that I already had for my business. And I, I decided I would give it Friday afternoons. That would just be my Christian thing. <laughs> but it soon just, it soon took over. Mm. Well, Steve, I want to transition now to um, when you got permission to write a course based off Neil's material. Um, So you told us the story of him coming to the UK and you opening the office. But in 2004, um, Neil gave you permission to write what we now know as the Freedom in Christ course. And it is our main discipleship resource um, that we recommend everyone to go through. And it has actually been used by over 500,000 people and translated into over 40 languages. So will you tell us what led you to write the Freedom in Christ course and how have you seen God use it in the lives of people around the world? Yeah, so um, I got the immense privilege of um, spending a lot of time with Neil and traveling with Neil. So he he was kind enough to come over to the UK once a year for a number of years. And also I travel with him in uh, other parts of Europe. And I I don't know whether any of you have experienced a conference with Neil Anderson, but what I found was I would sit there and I would listen and I would think, I know this is absolutely wonderful, but I don't know that I've really understood it. Um, and so I I had the opportunity to sit with Neil in a car and just say, when you say this, what did you actually mean? Uh, and then really to drill down and say, so in this scenario, what would that look like? And really get my head around what Neil was teaching. And then I kind of saw it as my role in life to take this incredible teaching that God has given us through Neil and to translate it into into a form that even I can understand, basically. Um, I modeled it very much on the Alpha course, which had come out of the UK at that time. It's an evangelistic course, very straightforward. And with their permission, um, modeled the Freedom in Christ course very much on the Alpha course. And a lot of churches started using it after Alpha. But essentially, that was um, very kind of Neil to give me permission to do that. And he did check it all. Uh, And so it was very much a partnership. Um, So I took his material, hacked it around, tried to make it as simple as possible, put it into 13 sessions. Neil checked it. And yes, it was launched in 2004. It's now in its third edition. Um, It's got kind of bigger and better each time. Actually, it's got smaller. It's now 10 sessions. Um, But it's been amazing to see how it's been taken up around the world and the impact it's had. In some ways, it really did launch Freedom in Christ internationally. So although there were some overseas offices, 
Um, it's this course that people found their way to, and they said, we need this in our nation. And so there are now about 40 countries around the world um, where we have people who are officially representing us or who are pioneering the establishment of freedom in Christ. Um, but there'll be many more countries than that where it's had an effect. I mean, one of the most exciting ones, well, probably the most exciting one to me, is mainland China. And so we partnered with a ministry uh, based out of Hong Kong who uh, have taken not just the Freedom in Christ course, but the other courses that have followed on from that, and they have translated them into Chinese, and they have put them onto an SD card that fits in a phone. And um, their objective is to send a million of those into the underground church in mainland China. Last time I got an update, which was actually a couple of years ago, um, they were into six figures. Um, and apparently each time one gets into the underground church, it is copied multiple times as well. And so we've no way of knowing what effect it's having there, but we know that an awful lot of them have gone in there. Um, it's really exciting. That is awesome. And I know, too, that it really has taken off on the continent of Africa and South and Central America. Really exciting to see how really the Lord is using this ministry, which just proclaims the entire gospel uh, in powerful ways in people's lives throughout the world. So how did developing that course push you from leadership over the UK ministry into international leadership? Well, 10 years ago, so in 2012, um, Neil asked me if I would consider um, leading the ministry internationally. I mean, up to that point, um, it hadn't been uh, led intentionally internationally. It came under the US office. Um, but the idea was that we would set up a, an international leadership. And um, that was privilege uh, to be asked to do that. And by that time, I'd given up my business as working full time in the ministry. And so for a period of time, um, I kind of tried to do the international development alongside the UK office. Um, but was working on finding a replacement for me in the UK um, and finally managed to do that so that for the last five years or so, I think, um, I've been focused uh, fully on um, on supporting our leaders around the world um, internationally. Hmm. And you are super passionate about helping leaders uh, church leaders uh, in particular understand the significance of these biblical principles and practices for the health of their church, their ministry, and accomplishing the vision that God has placed in their hearts. Will you tell us a little bit more about that passion for leaders to understand this and teach it to those they lead? Yes. Um I think so. When um, I first came across uh, the Freedom of Christ material, the Bondage Breaker book, um, Victory of the Darkness from Neil, um, the impression um, they gave me, I think mainly because of the examples that Neil chooses in the books, the impression they gave me was that this was for people with big problems. <laughs> and, it, and there are these incredible stories of people with the most significant issues finding their freedom in Christ. And as you've been doing in this podcast series, hearing about some of those. So it really does work there. But what, um, what occurred to me almost naturally, really, was that I needed this. You know, I told you that I have, I, you know, my background is not nearly as dramatic <laughs> or difficult as many people have experienced, but I really needed these principles just as much as they do. And uh, and it's it just dawned on me that it was a shame to kind of keep it only in a niche um, of the church, those who knew they had big issues, um, but really everybody needs this. We all need um, real freedom in Christ. None of us can't benefit from this. And so when writing the Freedom in Christ course, it was specifically written uh, to be discipleship for everybody, not just freedom for those who knew they needed it. 
It was, if you like, it was freedom for the majority of people who didn't know they needed it. Um, but the, we've many times we've had people go through the course and say, oh, why didn't someone tell me this 30 years ago or 40 years ago? And a lot of people, they find it, it gives them a new lease of life in their Christian walk. And so having kind of worked out that the most effective use of this is discipleship across a whole church, um, it became clear to me that the most effective way to get it into a church was via the leader. And so we kind of worked out that being a ministry that really helped church leaders do effective discipleship in their church was where we where we should be. Um, and we want to help pastors and leaders um, in their own life, as well as equipping them to help others. And so we've moved into um, other resources. So, for example, we have um, we have a course called Free to Lead, which is really about how do you lead out of your identity in Christ. It's not specifically about church leadership. It's leadership in any sphere. But church leaders have found it really helpful in learning to operate out of genuine rest um, and get rid of the pressure to perform as a leader. And we have um, a 10-month program called Transform specifically for leaders where they can process the Freedom in Christ message and material for themselves um, and then take it into their churches. And so, yes, I'm really passionate about helping leaders get hold of this and moving away from the idea that this is not for every Christian, that it or that it's just somehow for people who've got particular issues um this is really for everybody and what i love about it is um the same approach works with the main leader as with what you might call the most messed up person in their church um it's exactly the same approach that's required and both of them benefit from it so nobody gets labels i really love that mm -hmm. yeah yeah, we have seen uh, leaders grow and get stronger in their leadership from the grinding pace and demands of Washington, D.C. here in the States to small country churches where they become more free to relate to their people uh, in health and with less anxiety. So we're seeing tremendous change in leaders, but also, like you said, this is for every believer because, as I love to say at the end of our podcasts, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Uh, I just heard Neil a few weeks ago say, if people aren't free in Christ and walking in that freedom, no program is going to work. But if people are free, almost any program can work to help them grow on toward maturity. So I can just give a hearty amen to all that you're saying there about the importance of leaders understanding this so they can pass it on then to their people. And we find people become better employees, uh, stronger witnesses, healthier in their marriage and their parenting, more joyful. It's truly amazing to see God work in wonderful ways. So Steve, thank you so much for all you do to lead this ministry uh, internationally. Uh, we appreciate you and thank you for sharing your story today on Stories of Freedom. Thank you too. Well, many of us have just tried to stop a negative or harmful behavior. Well, I know I couldn't. And for all those of us who can't just stop, we're going to talk about what to do after the break. So you just heard Steve talk about something called transform. Now more than ever, Christian leaders need to be firmly grounded in the biblical principles of identity, freedom, and transformation. This is what transform offers. Transform is an eight month program for any Christian leader who is ready to take the next step and go deeper with God on a personal level. Whether you're a pastor, small group leader, or work in business, Transform will equip you to be the leader God has called you to be and see greater freedom and fruitfulness in your life and ministry. The program runs from January to September and includes weekly reading, homework, and meetings over Zoom with two retreats throughout the year. Transform offers access to Freedom in Christ resources in an honest, safe environment alongside other Christian leaders where you're not expected to perform but simply be yourself. 
If you want to lead in a way that makes a major impact for the kingdom of God, then we encourage you to apply to Transform today. To learn more about Transform and to apply, go to FICM.org or click on the link in the show notes. Wow, what a great interview with Steve. I love him, respect him. He's got a great ministry, wonderful. He's got a wonderful sense of humor, too. He loves to mm-hmm. loves that he's free in Christ and able, able to tell corny jokes. Uh, so a man after my own heart, that's for sure. Well, hey, one of the things he talked about was that uh, when he went into the Steps to Freedom, he didn't like the idea of a formula. And it just makes me think of that word, blech. Like a uh, formula, right? Our relationship with God is not a formula. It's a relationship. But what I learned through the steps and through what we'll talk about here in just a minute is that this is helpful in terms of how do I express my heart before the Lord? I love the sentence in the steps to freedom that says, the steps don't set you free. Jesus sets you free. And you'll progressively experience that as you respond to him by faith in repentance. What hit you, Abby? Yeah, um, specifically the part where he was talking about the stronghold busters. um, One thing that struck me is I didn't realize that he was the one that first developed stronghold busting and put that term to it, um, obviously using Neil's material, but I thought that was fascinating. Um, And then I really love the story he told about the woman who took the stronghold buster from uh, the course, which Steve had developed, the one about comfort eating. And she was doing it and said, it's not working. And through his conversation with her, realized that her root lie was actually different. Even though it was in the realm of eating, comfort eating, that um, what she was believing, the lie behind it was very different than his. Um, And he just talked about that's why We don't have just like these sample stronghold busters just for you to pick and choose um, because it's really important for the Holy Spirit to reveal that to you and it to be personalized for each person. Yeah, well, because every one of us grew up in a different household, going to Mm -hmm. a different church. We have different personalities. Mm -hmm. We've been impacted by our friends, the school we went to, the community we grew up in, traumas that we've experienced. You know, the world, the flesh, and the devil impact each of us differently. And the Lord knows personally what the lie or the root lie is. Yeah. What else were you going to say? Yeah. I was just going to kind of bring it back to, again, the importance of the stronghold buster, um, which is from Romans 12 and the idea that we're not to be conformed to the patterns of the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And that this Mm -hmm. process of stronghold busting is really just renewing our minds. Um, And I think the whole 40 days thing, too, was cool to hear his perspective on that and how there's research behind that, uh, the six weeks to form a habit and um, and how important it is to stick with it. He said, you know, you may up to 37 days, not it doesn't feel true. And I definitely have experienced that. It does not feel true for most of that time. But then at the very end, you hit a point where finally that truth is sinking deep um, and you start to see the effects and start to actually believe it. And so, yeah, I would love just to give a definition for our listeners of what a stronghold is. So a stronghold is a mental habit or thought pattern, often reinforced by behavior that goes contrary to God's will, word, and ways. Um, And we know in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 5, that we are not waging war in the flesh, but also that the weapons of our warfare have divine power to demolish strongholds. And then we're instructed to take every thought captive. Um, And so again, that's a little bit of the why to the stronghold buster. But Dan, will you go a little bit more in depth about what a stronghold buster is? Yeah, absolutely. And just a quick comment before we go into what it is, is when I was in youth ministry, one of the most common questions I got was, how do I know God's will for my life? Right. And that that Romans passage that you read, we're to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we can know God's will, so that we can be aware of what that is, right? So, and and this spiritual battle that we fight, it's fought uh, primarily in 
our mind, in our thinking. That's why we're to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ, as that Second Corinthians 10 passage says that you quoted. So the Stronghold Buster gives us the how-to. How do I do that? So number one, we identify the lie. Steve mentioned mm. asking friends, right? Loved ones who care for you, know you well, want the best for you. Uh, this could be a pastor, um, another ministry leader. If you're if you're up to it, ask your spouse or kids. They know because they live with you, right? And they see those things in you that maybe don't line up with uh, who God says he is and what he says about us and uh, obedience to him. Another way, a few other ways that I was thinking of after the interview is our steps to freedom process literally is just about asking God by his Holy Spirit to reveal to our mind the ways that our thinking and our lives don't line up with him. And so we have to take that time to listen to him. He knows everything. Mm -hmm. The question is, are we willing to ask him and take the time to listen? We also can be, we need to be in God's word on a regular basis. There are so many times where the clear commands of God's word have revealed my disobedience. And Jesus said, it's out of our heart that our mouth speaks, that our attitudes and actions come. So when my obedience or disobedience, when my life doesn't line up with God's word and the clear commands there, then I have to look at what's going on in my heart. What's a lie I'm believing that's excusing my behavior or driving my behavior? What's behind that? Another thing that came to mind is persistent or even unexplained negative emotions or outlook. Because Jesus said, I've come that you may have my joy, that it may be full and complete in you. You know, we love because he first loved us. So if we're not walking in that life that he said he came to give and is not denying that there are hard circumstances, times of grief, trial, things like that. But if we're not experiencing that, there's something going on inside and we need to take the time to look at that. But then also a very clear one is Galatians 5, 22 and 23, where he says, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So we have to identify the lie. We have to identify how does it impact our life. And then we go into what are the counteracting scriptural truths. And then we create from the lie a renunciation, I renounce the lie that, and we want to say those things out loud, and I announce the truth according to God's word that, and then you fill in the blank, customized for you from God's word. We'll put more in the show notes of how to do this, how to build your own stronghold buster, but that's the practical how to take my thoughts captive and be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Any last thing from you, Abby? Yeah, just I really would encourage people to check out those links. And um, there's even a training video that you can watch. Um, just like Steve said, the people that have embraced this and run with it just see a lot of fruit. Um, and I know I've seen it in my life. I know you can attest to that as well. So we'd really, yeah, encourage everyone to try it out. Yeah, it takes work, but it's so worth it. Because after all, it's for freedom that Christ set us free. Thanks for listening to this episode of Stories of Freedom. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And help us get the word out by sharing Stories of Freedom with your family and friends. To learn more about freedom in Christ, visit FICM.org or follow us on social media by searching Freedom in Christ USA. The links are in the show notes.